the Nava Universe with your host Dawn and this is part two of my August 2020 reads. I decided to break it up into two parts because I read 13 books in August and I didn't want to do it all in one podcast. If you hear a lot of noise in the background, my windows open and there are a lot of people enjoying their Labor Day. It is Labor Day so you might hear random screaming in cars and fireworks so just FYI. Before I get into the podcast, I'm going to start doing a little disclaimer when I just do the podcast by myself just for new listeners. And uh, the first one is if you want to read my my reviews in like writing form, um, you can follow me on Goodreads. My handle is Bang Bang Books. Um, second disclaimer is I am a teen librarian. And third disclaimer is I am black. I like to say that because a lot of times I review books by black authors and it's just better to know that the reviewer is black so that you don't think I'm saying something, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Insensitive. All right, let's get started. So the next book I read in, uh, what month is this? August is Burn by Patrick Ness. I gave this a four. It's a reluctant four. At first, I had like a 3.8, but I think I bumped it up a little bit. So, uh, okay. Well, I have to do a summary. I hate doing summaries. I don't know why, but I try to do them in 30 seconds or less because I hate doing them. So let's see if I can get this in 30 seconds or less. I doubt it. Burn is about Sarah. It is set in the 1950s, and Sarah is a biracial girl her father is white her mother is black she lives in I want to say Washington state and in this world dragons exist and her father has hired a dragon to help tend his farm which is kind of a no-no but he has no other choice uh Sarah's mother has passed away also by the way at the same time there are people who are, have a cult of they love dragons and they have a cult about them and Somebody is hunting the chosen one and somebody is hunting the person who's hunting the chosen one. And it's a Patrick Ness book. That's all I need to say. I don't think I did that on the 30 seconds. I didn't have my timer ready, so I'm just going to pretend that I did. Well, let's get started into this review. All right, so I'll start with my dislikes. And my only dislikes was that my was my only dislike is that. OK, grammar. I'm an English major. I don't know why I don't know grammar today (laughs) is uh, it was too much info dumping. And I feel like Patrick Ness is a a good enough author to not do that. So I was really shocked when that happened. But the info dumping also contributed to a convoluted plot. Okay, so in this book, we have Casimir and he is our dragon and he is tending to Sarah's father's Uh, not her carded their farm and some things have happened and Sarah's like what's going on and Casimir basically just info dumps everything that's happening and then midway through the book he was like oopsies I'm wrong it's actually this and then another info dump and because the dragon lore and what's going on in this book isn't weaved into the story I kind of was confused because of the big info dump because he was giving a lot of information and it wasn't like it's tropey information. It's not like I've read this in another book before and I could kind of like fill in the gaps because this is totally different here. And I it was it was confusing and I had to like stop and like talk it out because I was listening to it and I didn't feel like rewinding because I didn't know where to rewind. So I was just like, okay, let me just try and figure this out from the information that I have gathered. Um... So, yeah, that was a really big problem. Also, there, this book has dragons in it, but the dragon lore is pretty non-existent, uh, which is unfortunate. It's, I feel like I didn't really talk about the, I, I gave a summary, but I didn't really feel like I talked about what this book, I'll get into that in the likes. Anyway, there's not enough dragon lore. Like I said, it's all info dumped. Like, I want to say that these people believe that dragons are Russian spies. I am not a history person. I do not know what was going on in 1950. I know it was post-World War II, 
pre-civil rights movement, but I don't know what was going on with the Russians around the 1950s. So I think it might have some historical fiction elements in there. I also didn't care too much to actually do some research. So if you are a historian or you like history, then you might know more than I do. Uh, this book also takes place after, well, it's after World War II. So it's after the Japanese internment camps. But anyway, I don't know what the Russians had to do in 1950. Maybe that's important. Probably is. I don't know. But he doesn't, they don't, Patrick Ness doesn't really explain this world at all. It's kind of like urban fiction because it's set in a, it's not a contemporary world. It's set in the real America in the 1950s with dragons so he doesn't have to explain the world necessarily because the world is what America was in 1950 it just includes dragons and people hatred of dragons and some people love of dragons so that was another problem uh this book is only 380 pages and I don't understand once again why he felt the need to info dump everything when he had time to actually kind of like space it out a little bit more and also I don't once again I'm going to say the word info dump I don't understand why authors don't recognize an info dump especially someone like Patrick Ness who's been writing for a while and is a pretty good writer it's like don't you know that you're just doing that like can you not do that anyway uh those were my well it was only one dislike that was one I guess dislike okay let's get to the likes uh Patrick Ness if you are familiar with his writing, you know that he does a lot of genre blending, and this book is no exception. Um, as I said, it is takes place in the 1950s, uh, and like I said, it might be some Russian things going on there, which kind of makes it historical fiction. Well, not it doesn't make it historical fiction, but it has historical fiction elements. There's also science fiction, because there is a multi-universe that is not a... Well, I didn't say that in the summary, but it's not a spoiler because it's in the description on Goodreads. So there is a time jump and a world jump, universe jump in this book. Then there is a fantasy element because we have dragons. So there's kind of like four genres in here, contemporary historical fiction, science fiction, and fantasy. And he does it well. Like at no time was I like... Oh, yeah okay like dragons are really existing on this farm like I never felt that way I was just like oh okay well there's dragons existing on this farm sure I'll go with it um and when as a reader you're able to do that I feel like the author has done their job so I did like the genre blending there were a lot of characters in this very short book and all of them were pretty good they were developed enough I'll say that um what one character I really I don't know if I liked him but I thought I didn't like him and you'll understand why when I say it uh there was one character that I thought was an interesting character and that was the sheriff and he took place in the 1950s world not the the multiverse sheriff well he existed in both universes but in the universe I'm talking about uh he is a racist cop and like I said, our main character is biracial. Her mother is black and her father is white. And her boyfriend is Japanese. And her his mother had died in the Japanese internment camps. And so the sheriff encounters these two characters. I believe his name was Jason, the boyfriend. Sarah is the girl, the main character. And he's kind of, he's, we're listening to his, um, conscious or you know his inner monologue as he's stopping these two young people and he's saying in his head that as a cop he knows what he can get away with and I found that very interesting because I am filming this in August 2020 and we are basically on our second civil rights movement with Black Lives Matter and as a black person, I do not know what goes on inside the head of a racist cop. I don't know what they're thinking. But I felt like this kind of gave, I don't know if this is real or not, but I felt like this kind of gave me a little bit of an insight to what a racist cop might be thinking. When they stop a black man or a Hispanic man, they may be thinking, I know what I can get away with because they tend to not be prosecuted when they kill people. Uh based on race so I don't know I kind of I kind of liked that part I thought it was interesting um 
Is there another character in this book that I really liked? No, not really. I thought they were all done pretty well across the board. Another thing this book does is, like I said, there are 13 characters. There are a lot of characters in this book. But it it's kind of hard to explain because, okay, if you decide to read this book, and I think you should, I really want you to pay attention to every character in the book because they are all important. Even if you think it's just a passing car and it is not important, it is. Pay attention to everybody because they all kind of come back in some sort of way. And I thought that Ness did a really good job of that. I liked that part of the book. What I didn't like was the dragon part. Because honestly, if he had been a gargoyle, it wouldn't have made the story any different. Like, it didn't need to be a dragon. The dragon wasn't important to the plot. It could have been a pixie. It could have been anything. It could have been a human of a different race. It really didn't matter. And that's not good. It's actually not a good thing when you can substitute something, a major part of your book, and it doesn't impact the plot. It's kind of a problem. I really wish he had to use the dragons in the story a little bit better. Another thing um, Patrick Ness does well is he bends tropes. He writes, and it's not necessarily writes against trope. He like purposely goes out of his way to write against a trope. So if you read The Rest of Us Just Live Here, at that time, every book was about the chosen one. It still kind of is, but really at that time, every book was about the chosen one. And Patrick Ness wanted to write the story about the kid who lives down the street from the chosen one. And it's just living their life and how the chosen one's shenanigans are impacting that person's life. So this one is kind of like that, too, where he takes a pretty common trope and he bends it. I don't think he does it nearly as well as the rest of us just live here, but he does try that again. Okay, um, I was looking on Goodreads because this book actually kind of has, in my opinion, it's a lower rating. It has like a 3.7 or 3.8 or something, which means it has more threes and fours. And I was trying to figure out why. Oh, well, I was not trying to figure out. I was reading like the lower ratings and trying to see why everybody didn't like this book. And what I've discovered, what a lot of people said was that there wasn't enough dragons in it. They are correct. Here's what's up. When you read a Patrick Ness book, do not go into this book with any preconceived ideas. Patrick Ness writes weird YA, which is a subgenre of contemporary and like um, science fiction. It's weird. It's different. So when you are getting yourself into a weird YA, you can't say, well, I think this is going to have a love triangle or I think this is going to have amazing dragon fights because it's not. It's never going to be what you think it is. So when you read a Patrick Ness book, this is my fourth book by him. Just just go in with the open mind as you read this book, because if you go into this book thinking you're going to get a lot of dragons and you don't get it and you give it a two because of that, technically that's not Patrick's fault. That's your fault. But just go for the ride. Just just hang in for the ride and just have a good time as you possibly can. The next book I read. So what basically what I'm going to do is go uh, back and forth. So I'm going to do like a good rated book. And then a lower rating and good and lower. So the next one I read was The Inheritance Games by Jennifer Lynn Barnes. I gave this a three. All right, let's do a 30 second summary. What's her name, character name? Avery. Okay. Avery is kind of poor. Well, she's not kind of, she is poor. Her mother has passed away. She doesn't know who her father is. And she is living with her sister and her abusive boyfriend. She's sick of her abusive sister's boyfriend so she goes and lives in her car and then when she's at school the next day they're like hey this billionaire has left you money you need to get on the plane and find out what's in his will she ends up inheriting his entire fortune off we go yes seven seconds okay so if you've seen the movie knives out this is knives out if you haven't seen the movie knives out you should see it because it's a really good movie and it's basically what i just said it's about a family it's about this girl who's just a working class girl whose very wealthy employer leaves all her money to all his money to her and the family is pissed this happens in this book as well once again before I start this is my third Jennifer Lynn Barnes book I loved The Fixer I thought it was a great book if you want to read a political mystery intrigue book I highly recommend The Fixer um 
I didn't actually this is my fourth book by her I didn't like the one book with all the roses on the cover I hated that book but I really like to fix herself like okay I'm gonna give this book another chance I'm gonna give her another chance because I kind of like her writing style I think she's a really good mystery writer her pacing is usually pretty well done her characters are usually pretty good she usually fall for that shitty romance trope so I'm like let's go disappointed and here's the main one the execution okay so this book is the main character Avery has never met this guy who's left her money she lives in I don't even know but he lives in Texas she doesn't even live in the same state as him she's never met this man she doesn't know why he's leaving her money and so it's kind of a mystery and so we we have a mystery she's trying to figure out who he is and why he's left her all this money and of course his family is very upset because they he has left them nothing and this is the type of book where there are no clues for you as the reader to kind of figure out on your to figure out along with the main character this is the type of book where you are just there to be along for the ride as the main character tries to solve the mystery that's fine however if you're going to write a book like that then your characters, in my opinion, your characters and the mystery have to drive the plot. They have to be interesting because if I'm not spending time trying to figure out the mystery, I'm spending time trying to get to know these characters and getting to like these characters. However, if you don't do that, then I'm bored. And that's what happened. I didn't like the main character. She was a snooze fest. Then there are four grandsons. So the guy who dies has four grandsons. And two of the boys were quirky and if you've listened to my podcast before you know that I have said in the past that it is against the law to have two quirky people in the same book you just can't have that can only be one there are two here and neither one of them are any good I believe one of them was supposed to be the Chris Evans from Knives Out which Chris Evans is hot as hell by the way and he was great in that movie but you can't have two quirky Chris Evans you only have one and then there's a sub mystery like a a B plot where there's another death on this compound where this guy lives and it like drags out through the second half of the book when all the main character had to do was say hey how did she die problem solved we didn't need to spend 150 pages on this shitty mystery that I could give a care about all she had to do was say how she died that was it it was horrible pacing horrible pacing it was so slow like I said the characters booty the mystery booty I just didn't care and I gave it a three because it wasn't a bad book it wasn't terrible I've read way worse as a matter of fact I read way worse in August But it just wasn't good either. It was just kind of meh. This is a good book for if you are a teen librarian and you're looking for a book to give to teens who like mystery, but they're not a big reader or you know that they can't take like a really dense mystery story, then I would say give them this book. I only had one like in this book and that was the sister. I think her name was Libby. She was a good character because there were times where Libby was kind of a dinkus and a naive, not naive, but she was just too nice. And Avery called her out on her shit all the time. V- very deservedly so. She called Libby out on her shit. And every time Libby would be like, I'm your sister. I am your caretaker. And if something is happening to you, you need to tell me. She never fought with Avery she never was disappointed in her she supported her the entire time and I just thought that was great that's the only thing I liked about this book was the sister okay the next book I read I'm supposed to go all right well it seems like the rest of these books that I read are not books that I particularly enjoyed so except for the last one so there's no like higher book now looks like we're going good meh bad meh meh really good (laughs) all right uh, let me get my goodreads i'm kind of stalling for goodreads here the next book i read was lobazana by 
Romina Garber. I gave this a two. A big old two. Alright, I need to pull this up on my Goodreads because I have forgotten the main character's name and I read this two weeks ago. Yikes. That's how I know I don't like a book when I don't remember the main character's name. What is her name? Manuela. Manuela. Alright. Lobazana is about... 30 second summary. Manuela, she is an immigrant from Venezuela and she is constantly in fear of ice coming to pick her up and her family. She, they live with this old woman who's like her teacher. It, this woman is not any relation to them, but she lives with them. Her and her mom live with them and this woman schools her and Manuela cannot leave the house because she has really weird colored eyes and so just to avoid questions and everything she doesn't really go outside much one day ice comes they pick up her mom she has to run and she finds some people like her kind of like hogwarts okay so there were lots of problems with this book obviously i gave it a where's my review dang it i know i wrote one. Oh hell no <laughs> yeah find my review I can't find my review. Seriously. Oh my God. Okay. I wrote a review. I know I did. Now I just got to wing it. Oh God. Okay. Um, Goodreads is tripping. I wrote a review. I know I did. Okay. Here it is. I was about to say, I know I wrote a review. Sorry. All right. So the main problem with this book is that the author was doing way too much. It's the doing too much. Itis has, um, reared his head again. Uh, the first one of the first things I didn't like was I didn't like the main character, which is a problem. Actually, that's not true. I'm lying. I can't read my own writing or I can't read my own typing. <laughs> I didn't like the narrator, but that has nothing to do with the book because I, I listened to it. I just didn't like the narrator. But anyway, that's not part of the review. Uh, as I said before, she ends up going to Hogwarts. There are so many Harry Potter references in this book. It's disgusting. Like, I, I know I can tell you love Harry Potter. I get it, but yikes the romance yikes <laughs> she meets this guy and he's hot because he's got in a leather coat and he's nice to her and I don't know how long she's known this guy but it's one of those things in romance where she basically is just like I'll give up everything because I love you bullshit <sighs> this book has a uh, a lot of feminism all up in my face don't like that tons of tropes tons of tropes trope number one she's the chosen one trope number two she's been lied to her whole life um trope number three she has special eyes oh give me a break um and yeah those are the tropes that were terrible and the last thing I did not like about this book is so the the author makes a point to to tell the reader that she is an undocumented immigrant. And so you think going in that that's what you're going to get. You're going to get something about undocumented immigrants mixed in with some werewolf stuff. You don't really get I mean, you do, but you don't. And it's what I'm talking about. Okay, so I said at the beginning of the podcast I am black I was born in this country so I do not know what it feels like to be an undocumented immigrant I do not know what it feels like to be scared of ice or all of the above the only thing that I can surmise from that experience is from what I see on tv or reading books or watching movies or the news now um it's just living in constant fear of being deported that's all I really know. So when I read books like this, I want to know what it feels like to be that main character, especially if I have not experienced that because I am not an undocumented immigrant. I am reading this book hoping just to get one example, one instance, something that happens that I didn't know that happened to undocumented immigrants. Yes, I can guess that when you see sirens, you're on high alert all the time. I can feel I can figure that out when no the knock comes on the door and they yell ice and you're trembling out of the bed yeah that's a human response I can figure that out I'm looking for something different and I'm going to give you an example as a black woman there are lots of 
things that black women have to deal with. And I'm going to tell you a couple of those that you probably didn't know, especially if you are not black. One of them is my hair. My hair is natural, meaning I have it is an afro, but I wear my hair braided all the time, mostly because I don't know how to do my hair. And so I just wear it in braids because I, I just don't feel like dealing with it. The last time I went out to look for a job, I took my braids out and I flat ironed my hair because there was a thing called hair discrimination. I didn't want to not get a job because the person interviewing me didn't want a person with an afro or braids at their library. Okay, that is a thing. If you are not white or if you are not black, sorry, you may not have known that because why would you? Why would you know that unless you have like a, a, a black husband or wife or you have a lot of black friends and they tell you I don't know but you wouldn't know that another example of not just being a black woman but being just a black person when I was in high school I took a trigonometry class my senior year it was like my like the first semester of senior year because I don't I don't know why I was an English major I don't know why I wasn't particularly great at math but I just wanted to challenge myself I suppose and in this class there were a lot of AP students or advanced placement students And this was in the 90s, by the way. Um, I was the only black person in this class, and I hated that. So my trick teacher decided it was a good idea to tell us, not to tell us, but he thought it was a good idea to post our grades by name on the blackboard. And so I was like, are you fucking kidding me with this? I guess he thought that was going to make us work hard. Well, it did. I have never worked so hard in my life Because as being the only black person in that class, in a class of a bunch of like advanced placement students, and most of the kids in this class were in the top 10%, one of them was probably Valley Victorian Salutatorium. I felt like I had the weight of every black teen in that school on my shoulders. And I went to a pretty big high school and it was so much pressure. I felt like, oh my God, if I am in the middle or at the bottom of this list, they're going to think that all black kids are dumb. And I couldn't do that. So I studied the hardest I've ever studied in my life because I didn't want to let my black students down. What kind of bullshit is that? I actually did get the top. First quarter, my name was on the top. And yes, I got a lot of, oh my God, you're on top? Yes, motherfucker, I'm on top. So that is what it feels like to be a black person in America. Once again, if you're not black, you may not have known that. Sometimes black people take the weight of other black people on our shoulders and it is stressful. I was expecting that from Lobazana. I didn't get that. Instead, I got tropes. I got a bad romance. And another thing I got, which was insane, was Manuela has, her mother has just been picked up by ICE. She's seen it. The old woman that she lives with is in the hospital for some kind of trauma she suffered. And Manuela, her mom was like, go, go, go. So she escapes. She finds the school by accident. And she is uh, living her best life at the school. Forgot about her mama. She is having boyfriends. She got new best friends. She on the soccer team scoring goals. And she is like, ice who? Mama what? I was like, are you kidding me with this? So, yeah. Um... I, I didn't like anything about this book. Nothing. I'm, I don't know why I gave it a two. Technically, but I don't like anything about a book. I give it a one. But I think because its own voices, I feel bad. So I just was like, okay, I'll give it a two. All right. Next book is A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. Oh, I got to do a summary. Okay. Oh, Lord. What are their names? I read this last week and I've already forgotten their names. Jeez Louise. I literally don't remember these girls' names. Tavia, Tavia, and Effie are kind of like adoptive sisters. And Tavia is a siren. And in this world, sirens are treated badly because they can influence you. People don't like sirens. And, uh, I honestly don't know what this book is about. Her best friend doesn't know what she is. She thinks she's a mermaid, but she's not quite sure. And then some shenanigans happened. I don't even know what the hell this book is about. I give this book a three. All right. Um, this book is not a bad book. It's, it's fine. It's just kind of meh. That's why I gave it a three, but it's not bad. 
but it's not great either. All right, so uh, first problem is that this book is only 280 pages. That's really short. However, it felt really long. I, I listened to it, and the audiobook is pretty, is okay. But I listened to it, and oh, I was probably midway through, and I was like, oh my god, is this book over yet? That's how long it felt. The biggest problem with the book is that it's boring. It's, there's no nuance here. I, I've heard these voices before. I've read this plot before. I just, like I said, it's not a bad book. It's just, I've re- it's familiar. It's familiar. I've read this before. If you are new to YA fantasy, go for it. I mean, sure. If you have teens who are new to YA fantasy, then, you know, you could give them this book. Maybe they are, maybe they want to read some diversity or maybe see themselves in a book. I Then you can give them this book. But um, if you're an adult reader who reads out of fantasy, you might be bored. Okay, so this book has a lot of Black Lives Matter over overtones in this book. Uh, there is a pretty on-the-nose metaphor of sirens are hated just like... I don't want to say black women are hated, but black women got problems. Like I said, black women deal with a lot from major things like higher rates of death and childbirth, especially if their doctor is white. Black women have have had a history of dying in childbirth because they're black. If you did not know that, you should look it up. It's pretty shitty. All the way to hair. Like I said, hair discrimination. Um, But like I said, it's on the nose. It's like, okay, so at the start of the book, there is a siren who was beaten and killed by her boyfriend. And so everyone's kind of like following the trial to find out if the siren is going to be vindicated, not vindicated, but if her boyfriend's going to go to jail for killing her because she's a siren or if he's going to go free. And I'm not going to tell you because it's a spoiler, but it's pretty... Like, I think only sirens can be black women in this book. And so it's just when they have conversations in history class, it's just like, oh, it's just so on the nose. It's just so, which it's not, that's just not good writing. Like, if you're going to use a metaphor like that, do something with it. Um, Moro also doesn't set up the siren thing. She just kind of says sirens are they get a bad rap because they can influence by their song but she doesn't really go into the lore of sirens she also doesn't really talk about how sirens are hated like i said at the beginning of the book this is a woman who's beaten killed by her boyfriend because she's a siren but that happens at the very beginning of the book and i did not have any emotion toward this woman or her situation because she wasn't set up for me to care it was just like another thing and it's a lot of telling a lot of telling not a lot of showing um i'm gonna give you an example so if you read the fifth season by mk nk jemison sorry in the fifth season our main character is son see i remember is name and i read that book in like march and i read this book two weeks ago and i already forgot their names so is is an origin and so are her children and her husband killed her three-year-old because he was an origin when that moment happens you are distraught because jemison set up the book for you to understand what it feels like to be an origin and how poorly they're treated moral doesn't do that here so when things happen to sirens i'm just like oh I mean, because it is a metaphor for black women, I can sympathize because I deal with that shit all the time. But if you're not black or if you're not a woman, then how, why would you know? Like, you don't get that metaphor. Why do you care? And yeah, it was just not done well. Uh, oh, oh, there's a villain in this book, too. She's your classic mean girl. And she was shitty. I don't understand what the hell purpose this girl was. It was... I hate it when a villain is done bad. Villains are my favorite. And when you do a villain bad, I'm not going to be happy. And I wasn't happy with this villain. I like the attempt. I appreciate what she was trying to do with the whole siren thing. But it just was not 
developed at all. Oh, 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 there was one other good thing. There's a gargoyle. I am not interested in gargoyles. I think it's like, why would I think a gargoyle? It's sexy. It's stone and their faces are hideous. However, there's a sexy gargoyle in this book. And that was what I was reading it for. I was like, okay, let's get to the sexy gargoyle. So the gargoyle was the gargoyle, which I thought was pretty cool. This is a family. Well, the main girl is a siren and the other girl is something else. She's also a monster. In this world, monsters are um are fine. Like they live amongst humans, but it's just sirens that are hated. And so a gargoyle just decided to perch himself on their roof. Just cause. And they're like, why? Why is this gargoyle on our roof? What is he a bad omen? Is he trying to protect us? And he like moves and you can like talk to him and so but he's like really chiseled and cut and hot and I was like hoo hoo hot gargoyle so if you're looking for some hot gargoyles you know I guess you can give that one a try all right the next book I read was Crier's War by Nina Varela okay here goes my description what's our main character's name Crier <laughs> it's the title character okay so this book is, I don't know, there's no, it's science fiction, so there's no real setting. And But in this world, androids have basically taken over humans, and they are um, the leading class, and humans are the oppressed class. And Cryer is the daughter of the emperor or the king, I'm not sure which one. Uh, the sovereign daughter, I don't know, let's just go with emperor. She's the daughter of the emperor. And then there's Ayla, who is a human, and her entire family had been killed by the automatons. Automatons? Yes, they're automatons. What did I say? Android? They're not androids. They're automatons. But they look human. And so she is seeking revenge, and she is going to kill Cryer. Plot twist! She falls in love with her. Oh my god, I'm so sick of that trope. This is the third book. The third book I read this year, where it might be the fourth book, now that I think about it. Sorry, that was email. This might be the fourth book where this happens. Oh, my God. Uh, where the main character is set out to murder someone. And then they be like, ooh, I love you now. <laughs> I'm so sick of that trope. Can we? Can someone recommend a book where they actually kill the person they are intended to kill? Because I want to read that book. Okay, I gave this book a three and a half. Uh, this book had such potential, too. I was really bummed. All right, so the main issue I had was, uh, <laughs> it was the, the supporting characters. I felt like this book focused so much on Cryer and Ayla and trying to develop their romance. It kind of forgot about the other characters that were actually more interesting than the two of them. In particular, the king, Cryer's father. He is, did I say we're going to call him the emperor? Let's call him the emperor. He is supposedly to to the peep to crier in the automaton nation he's kind of like the author arthur weasley where arthur is very interested in muggles and he studies muggles and that's his job in the ministry and he's really interested in harry because he's a muggle or he was raised by muggles so he's kind of like that where he's like really interested in humans and how they celebrate and how they interact and he wants automatons to kind of emulate this and he wants the human race to have jobs and food and he hates their starving but to the humans he's a fucking tyrant and I liked that I was like okay um we have two perceptions of the same man and the reader kind of sees both of those sides so it's kind of like well, what kind of a person is he? Of course, he's probably up to no good because no one cares about an empathetic king. Uh, but his storyline wasn't really developed. The second character that was really good was the the betrothed. Cryer was betrothed. I can't remember his name to some guy. And he was kind of a he kind of like started the war over the humans and he won the war or something like that. So he's heralded. But once again, he's kind of like the emperor in that he has like all these ideas. And to some people, those ideas are great. But to some people, they're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. And he's a very interesting character because he's up to some hellish shenanigans. But on the surface, he's a really nice guy. And I kind of wanted more of him. Once again, didn't get any. 
And then the other character that was really good was, I don't know her name. I'm just going to call her Queen Junga. That's probably wrong. But she is, there was a, a land that kind of seceded from the rest of the world. And she is the queen of that world. Kind of like Jon Snow. <laughs> he was like, I'm the king of the north. And she comes to visit and she is fascinating. Once again, she only got a chapter. Now, she's probably going to be in book two. It's probably going to be a lot of her in book two and probably the betrothed as well. However, I don't care to read book two because I didn't really like book one enough to read book two. If those characters had been in that book, then perhaps I would have been willing to read book two, which I think comes out either this month or next month, September or October. Um, what else? Okay, the world. I like the idea of the world, even if it is a robots are taking over the world thing, which has been done to death. But I liked it, but I felt like there was something missing. And I think it has to do with my first point, which was the character development. Some of it were, were underdeveloped. And one thing about this book is that automatons, of course, lack humanity. They don't have a heart. That is how they uh, differ from humans the most. And it would have explained the emperor and the betrothed and why they were kind of callous. Maybe the, the emperor was putting on a show as far as being empathetic and maybe he really wasn't. Because how can you have empathy if you don't have that human trait? which could be a plot hole, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but it would explain a lot of people's behavior, but because those characters were underdeveloped, we don't really see... we That that theme is not really developed well at all. Um, Cryer is supposedly different from other androids. I don't know if this is a spoiler, because I didn't read the summary, but she's a little different from other androids. Or, she's not android, automaton. Uh, but... Clearly because she falls in love and automatons don't. Even though she's betrothed, she doesn't love him because they don't know what love is and they can't have babies because they don't have human junk, you know, so they get their their babies are built for them. But she falls in love with Ayla because of a plot point. And it's like throughout the book, I'm trying to figure out how does she feel about that? What does she know about that? Um how does Ayla feel about that? Does she question that? And there were moments of, there were moments that Cryer had where she asked really good questions, but it was only like one time where I felt that happen. But for the most part, I don't know why Cryer is different from other humans. Um, I, because it's never really explored. And once again, it's a lot of telling Cryer is like, observing humans and observing Ayla and their festivals and how beautiful Ayla is but I don't know it's just it was just something missing there it's, it's a really good opportunity to have a discussion about humanity and what makes you human is love only an emotion that a human being a quote-unquote human being can have is are automatons or robots capable of that? And what does that look like? And how do they feel about it? But, but there was really, it really wasn't explored. And that was unfortunate. Um, she takes up for her father a lot. And, you know, she's like defending her father. But it's like, how does she know to do that? Does she, does she really love her father? Is she just mimicking how humans love each other like once again no exploration of that at all and this is kind of the main point of the book and I just felt like it was a it was a letdown um I would have liked a little bit more critical writing from what's her name Varela once again potential the potential was there but she focused too much on this romance which dumbed down her book it was a pretty long book too like she had pr plenty of time to really go into some critical elements of the book and the romance but then it just ended up being stuff we've read before like there's a revolution of course there's a revolution because it's fucking duh it's a YA book the humans have to revolt against the the robots um so we got some focus on that and the characters with that and then there's a guy who loves Ayla and so there's a little bit of focus on that and it wasn't done badly or anything, but it was too much focus on this romance. And I have seen authors do a slow burn romance quite effectively in a short amount of time. 
also writing really strong themes and symbolism and all that other stuff that makes your book critical. So, yeah, unfortunately, I mean, a 3.5 isn't bad, but it's actually not good enough for me to read book two. I won't be reading book two. I do think you should read it. I mean, there's something in here that I think a lot of people will like. I personally didn't like it enough to read book two. The second to last book I read was The Black Kids. I have forgotten that author's name because I did not write it down. Oh, I forgot. I was going to talk about it. Uh, Christina Hammond's read. I gave, I'm not going to say what I gave that book. Uh, Ashley and I are going to be doing a more in-depth review of that in the next podcast. That's not true at the end of the month. <laughs> uh, our next podcast is going to be Blood and Honey by Shelby Mahirin. The last book I read, which Ashley and I already reviewed, was The Other Side of the Sky by Amy Kaufman and Megan Spooner. I gave this a four and a half. I really like this book. This is probably one of the highest rated books I've given this year. Uh, the only other one was As the Shadow Rises by Katie Rose Poole. That's book two of There Will Come a Darkness. But The Other Side of the Sky is about North. And North lives in the cloud lands up in the sky, but he wants to explore the below. But people are telling him there's nothing down there. There's no civilization down there. Do not go down there. And he's like, I'm going to go. So he does anyway, and he crash lands, and he meets Nim. And Nim is the goddess. She's a living god in her country, well, in her world. But she hasn't come into her power yet, and people are starting to lose their faith in her and faith is a really big a really big theme in this book and she has read a prophecy that she is going to meet a north star and he's going to help her and she thinks that north is did i say north star that ain't true she's gonna meet i can't remember the exact verbiage but <laughs> north star would be a little on the nose i don't think that's what it says but she's prophecy to meet north and she does and she thinks that he is going her him and her are going to save her people okay this book was really good. I really enjoyed it. It. I'm not going to go too much into it because we really do go in depth for like an hour. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into it. Just know that, you know, if you read Amy Kaufman before she wrote, she co-wrote Aurora Rising and she co-wrote Illuminae with Jay Kristoff. And you really see a lot of her writing in this series as well, which is why I think it's done really well I've only read one Megan Spooner book I read The Hunted and I think that Amy Kaufman might be the superior writer in this book but oh it really shows like it, you really see that Kaufman influences in this book but I thought that all the characters were done really well the main character Nim was conflicted and she was just a very well written character I thought North he was not that smarmy cheeky boy that we get a lot in YA he was a really good guy. There was a good villain. Uh, there was, I, I shipped both of them. I thought they were a really good couple. Oh, and by the way, Nim cannot be touched. She can't touch people. Otherwise, she'll lose her divinity or her power, the power that she, the little power she already has. Uh, this book blends science fiction and fantasy. It does it really well. There's a really cool cat. Like, there's a lot of really good stuff in this book. I'm excited to read book two. It comes out September 8th, which is tomorrow tomorrow i'm doing this podcast on monday it comes out on the 8th so definitely definitely pick that up okay that's it those are all the books i read in august you can click the link to hear part one of the books that i read in part one and i was gonna go down the list of those books i don't even know if i have a list the Project by Courtney Summers, A Girl on Frame by Deb Coletti, Punching the Air by Evie Zaboy, Midnight Sun by Stephanie Meyer, Mexican Gothic by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, and Ray Bear by Jordan Ifueco. That was in part one. Other than that, I will catch you in the next podcast. Bye.